episode, uh, I had the pleasure to meet with uh, Axel Lieber from Career Zeus, who really just gives a lot of good insight into uh, helping executives kind of become more strategic in the job market, particularly with their online presence on LinkedIn, uh, as well as their you know, creating or using his services to create a strategic uh, resume or CV uh, to really compete at the executive level. So yeah, have a listen through. Um, it's it's one of the longer interviews, but it's definitely really good insight if you're uh, at the executive level. So uh, watch all the way through and see you at the end. Hi, I'm Brad and welcome to another episode of Coffee for Closers. Uh, today, my guest is Axel Lieber, a veteran recruiter uh, here in Tokyo and founder of uh, Career Zeus. Uh, Axel, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. And yeah, for starters, can you just tell us a little about your background uh, and uh, how you got started in recruiting here? Yeah, uh, I moved to Japan in 1999. Uh, I had a job offer back then as a junior recruiter uh, with a local boutique recruiting firm. And then since then, I've been in Japan uninterruptedly. Um, I started my own business uh, in 2002, I think it was. Uh, that was a recruitment firm called Progress. And then that was the bulk of my experience. We did a lot of uh, senior level searches in financial services, professional services, um, pharmaceutical life science and so on. Um, and uh, that went on until you know, 2017, maybe 18, I guess. Um, and yeah, and then I uh, winded down. Okay, nice. And where where did you get the idea of uh, Career Zeus and, and what is Career Zeus? Yeah, so I was um, pretty tired of executive search. Um, and that was a process that unfolded over a number of years. Um, my wife, who has a um, rather uh, nice corporate career, um, frequently uh, asked me to help her with with her job changes, um, basically just hand-holding, um, you know, um, telling her, okay, this thing that happened was normal or it was not normal, was unreasonable, you know, or, you know, just rewriting a resume for her. Um, and, um, you know, even last year when she made her last career move, which um, led her to the sea level, she still um, needed my help a lot during the, the whole process of changing her job. And she told me that, you know, you should charge for this you know, you can charge for this because most people don't know this stuff, just like I don't know it. And um, it's it's real value. You know, my career wouldn't necessarily have gone as well as it has without your help. Right? So I was looking for something else to do. And this resonated. This is something that I know very well. Um, so it gives me a natural advantage uh, over other fields and over other people in the same field. So that's where how the career Zeus was born. And the career Zeus is basically two things. It's one thing is resume writing and online presence review. So that's mostly LinkedIn. And then the other part is uh, career. I should not say career. I have to stop myself there. Job change advisory. Yeah. So I'm not a career advisor. I'm not trained. I'm not qualified to advise people on the big picture of their career, what their psychrometric tests tell us about what they're, you know, best suited to or anything like that. But I am an expert on the mechanics of changing your job. So that's the advisory service that I offer as the career at Zeus. Okay, nice. Good stuff. And I mean, what do you find that um, some of your clients kind of struggle with initially when, when, when approaching a job change? Yeah, so um, my clients are mostly executives um, in all sorts of industries. It doesn't really matter. And around the world. So I have clients from the US, from Europe, Japan, other parts of Asia, India, um, and so on. So 
and they're all very experienced. Um, so at minimum 10 years of experience in a, in a you know, good corporate career, um, but usually more than 20 years experience. And well, what they're, what, what they're struggling with is things that to me seem like common sense because I've worked as an executive recruiter for 20 years. So there's a lot of stuff that to me seems just like, you know, normal stuff, you know, nothing out of the ordinary, just common knowledge. But it's not common knowledge to a lot of my clients, right? Which is understandable because they've never worked in HR. They've never worked as a recruiter. They've never been in this position, right? And so then that involves, that that covers what a good resume should look like. That's the first thing, right? And a lot of people, surprisingly, don't know this. To me, it's total common sense. But it's not common sense to them, right? And that's one of the the, the one of uh, that's a part of the value package that I have to to offer, right? And then it's all this other stuff, like I said, you know, with my wife, the recruiter said this and this. Is that for real? Is that or is that weird? You know? And then you know, well, that's you're right. That's actually really weird. You should push back on that, right? Or this offer. Oh my God, this is like a like a Christmas tree of components. You know, the more senior you get the more components are added into the offer, you know, restricted stock units, this, and then another type of restricted stock units, you know, and maybe even stock options, right? And all sorts of other things, right? And also what can I reasonably ask for and what would be seen as, you know, unreasonable or greedy, that sort of thing, you know? Um, Or no, they're telling me I got to join next week, but I just, possibly cannot do that. This is not, how do I deal with this, right? All these sort of things, right? And I think the more senior you become, the more um, value there is in this sort of advice relative to the money that you have to spend on it, right? When you're young and you're making, I don't know what it is, 50,000 bucks a year or something, paying for this kind of service is painful because it's expensive, right? But when you're a senior executive, the money that you have to spend on this stuff, making sure that your next career transition goes as smoothly and as well as it can, it, it, it's a minor expense, you know, and the, and the upside is enormous, you know, like one wrong move and you messed up your next career step, right? And I can help people prevent that from happening. And in light of that, the money you pay me is, you know, pocket change. Right. Okay. So this is like way beyond just <clears throat> tweaking a resume to get an interview. I mean, you you offer the full package of, like you said, kind of job uh, coaching or what, what What was your, you, you said, what, what was the term? Job? Uh, so job change advisory. <laughs> okay. So job yeah. change yeah, yeah. advisory, which, which is huge, right? So, um, I mean, how much of that do you think uh, recruiters should be doing and how much can you step in and help? And I guess my other question is like, how are all of your clients using agencies or recruiters? Or no, they- no, no. So, so um, I mean, yes, I mean, they, they are of course in touch with, usually they are in touch with all sorts of recruiters, right? But I mean, recruiters also have their own incentives um, one way or another, right? And so they are also just human beings, right? Even if they are very sort of forthright, sincere persons, they still are guided to some extent by their incentives, which may not always be aligned with the incentives of the job seeker, right? So to answer your first question, I think a good recruiter would and should do a lot of what I um, what I do, but they will do it with their own interests in mind, right? And if those interests are not fully aligned with your interests as a job seeker, then, you know, there may be some, let's say, suboptimal advice from the recruiter, right? But that's only one aspect. The other aspect is that a lot of job changes don't happen through executive recruiters. You know, they happen through your own personal network. They happen through, um, you know, uh, job applications via LinkedIn or, you know, job portals or whatever, right? And then there is nobody there who who can help you at all. And so, you know, a lot of my clients 
ask me for advice on those type of situations too. And by the way, the, the clients have the option to choose, you know, if somebody just wants a resume, that's it. You know, they, they can just get the resume and be done with it. But others who want the career change or the job change advice, they can opt for that as well. So these, these are two separate things paid for separately, you know, at the discretion of, of the client. Okay, nice. And I guess the other question is like, what, what is it that you, you don't do or industries that you don't support? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So, um, so far I have not accepted clients in academia and clients who are in very technical jobs. So very technical means you're actually doing technical, technological work, like a, you're a programmer or a, um, an engineer, you know, because uh, for jobs, for those type of people, often resumes are required that list a great amount of technical detail. And I cannot help with that because I don't understand it. I mean, and in academia, you're supposed to demonstrate your publishing track record right. and, you know, the conferences you've spoken at and so on. Right. And again, I don't really understand that world. So I find it really difficult to help people who come from that sort of background. And also, I don't work with um, junior uh, uh, white color uh, uh, people uh, simply because I couldn't make it work from a money perspective. It has to be profitable and attractive to me. And I, I don't think I can charge what's required here uh, to somebody who's making, I don't know, 30,000 or 50,000 bucks a year. You know, it'd be completely disproportionate and, and um, uh, you know, I wouldn't recommend it. So that's, I don't do that. I just work with executives or very experienced professionals. Okay, nice. And in, in general, like how long does it take to actually um, provide your service? Like, for example, if it's just a one-off resume or if it's the um, the full package that you offer, what's the, what's the timeline involved? So the way it works is I don't edit existing resumes. I do reference them. I do look at them. Uh, that's a, you know, efficient way of getting very basic information, like the the dates, the locations, the job titles, and that sort of thing. But uh, in order to create real value for the client, I need to focus on the things that I know from it, my experience are most important, and that usually requires creating a new resume. And so what I do is I interview the client for 90 to 120 minutes in the beginning. Um, very often, it, it, it's two hours. We take a break in the middle. Um, and then, uh, and then based on that and in combination with what I, uh, learned from their existing resumes and in combination with what I see on their LinkedIn profile, um, I, I create a sort of a synthesis that is designed for maximum impact. And that takes me, uh, usually two business days. So you have the interview and then you have two business days minimum, um, until the, next uh, video conference with the client, which is then to review the draft resume. That usually takes around 30 minutes. Then uh, normally uh, within 24 hours, they turn around the, the revised draft. And then at that point, often it's already like, okay, we're, we, we're ready to sign off here. This is, this is good. Uh, or there might be another round of revisions where the client feels it's still not really quite there. Right? And some we have another call and then 99% of the time, that's it. So it really depends uh, on the client, how quickly they can make themselves available. From my perspective, if somebody is in an enormous rush, I can do it in three to four days. And, and can you explain a little more about like the importance of a really good LinkedIn profile uh, versus the, the resume and, and how maybe you balance that? Yeah, so I think uh, a LinkedIn profile can uh, either just reflect your resume in full, or it can be an abbreviated version of that. Generally, probably more common, uh, and also from my perspective, probably more advisable to have a sort of a, a, a minimized version of the resume on LinkedIn. Um, but then what's uh, valuable about LinkedIn is that you can have recommendations on your page. And this is one of the things that amazes me that a lot of my clients don't have any recommendations. And the recommendations section is the one thing that makes LinkedIn sort of unique compared to a resume, right? And uh, uh, it's really um, 
you're leaving a lot of money on the table, so to speak, if you don't have recommendations, right? So recommendations give credence to the claims that you make about yourself. Um, they, they, you know, they show how well you're liked. Um, they're just an opportunity to, you know, to, to give social proof, right? And uh, it's really uh, surprising to me that not more people make use of this, right? So that's one thing. And then the other thing is the, 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 the quality of your engagement on LinkedIn. Yeah. So like how you interact with other people, the posts you make um, and, and the comments you make. Right. And again, to me, it's amazing that a lot of people don't seem to understand the, the damage that they can do to themselves on LinkedIn. Right. I mean, it's already, it's, I think it's on one hand, it's damaging to be silent. Yeah. If you're completely silent, I think that's potentially damaging because um, it's, you know, people will just uh, not be able to develop a feeling for you as a person, right? Um, and it, it makes you almost look like you have something to, you, you're, you're intentionally, tactically, deliberately not engaging, yeah? Because you, maybe you're afraid that you might come across the wrong way or something like that. That's not a sign of confidence. Now, the truth is, of course, that many executives are just way too busy right? They just really don't have time for it. And that's fine if that's the case, right? But when you're in that situation where you you need to change your job, maybe you should think about utilizing this opportunity to show a little bit of yourself um, in a sort of an open environment, right? And so, so, so not saying anything could potentially be damaging. But then on the other hand, what's even more damaging is saying the wrong things, right? Like people getting into political spats with, with random strangers on, on LinkedIn, right? That's just so, so unconstructive, right? Or making aggressive comments on, on stuff that they dislike, right? Um, so it's, it, it, it's partially the category of content that you engage in. Um, and then it's also partially the style in which you engage in. So, for example, I think that people should definitely take a position when they when they post on LinkedIn. It's super boring, and nobody cares about your like your congrats. You know, uh, congrats this uh, you to somebody who's pr promoted. I mean, okay, if you want to do that because you're friendly with that person, that's fine, right? But that's not. A, that really is of no interest to anyone, right? Uh, or, or if you make sort of uh, so lukewarm posts with nothing offensive that nobody ever is going to get riled up about, I, I question that there is a lot of value in that. In business, controversial opinions have often moved the needle for businesses, right? They controversial stances, breaking the rules. Being uh, uh, swimming against the stream has often created massive riches, yeah. And and so I think it is welcome and desirable to take a strong position on things, but do it in a style that marks you as a professional, right? Don't get personal. Don't get aggressive, right? Or passive aggressive, right? Um, you know, this is an opportunity to show what a strong communicator you are, right? Um, and again, I think a lot of people just completely miss that opportunity. And, you know, I think it's unfortunate. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I think that's a really valid point. I mean, even from a branding perspective, right? I mean, companies don't do that, but individuals I, I see as well, like you said, um, they're, they're not uh, having a stance or an opinion on anything, which is where, or a uh, very, you know, uh, trivial posts that don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, you know, it, especially at the sea level, right? I mean, you yeah, yeah. Be... yeah, yeah. And, and this is what, what, you know, what there is this buzzword of personal branding, right? I have not so far used that buzzword in any of my posts, any of my, you know, on my website, I don't use it, but that is what personal branding is, right? You know, if you are an individual that doesn't have a business that you represent, like, for example, if you have your own little company and you're trying to promote something, that's one thing, right? But for my clients, that's not normally the case. My clients are executives in in corporate careers, right? So the banner on their LinkedIn uh, profile is, you know, it, it's not very relevant that to their personal branding. But what they communicate through their engagements right, and through the recommendations that is personal branding, right? Yep. And if you don't have it, you have no personal branding, right? So, yeah. 
So no, definitely good, good, good points, valid points there. Yeah. So, you know, segueing into the actual resume or CV, like obviously LinkedIn, you can leverage a lot of your position or um, opinions on LinkedIn, which is good. How do you do that in a resume or a CV? Well, uh, you know, I think uh, this goes back to what I said initially, uh, common sense, right? Um, there is a competitor of mine whose uh, byline or, or, or sort of advertising slogan on their website is we help global executives um, gain six-figure uh, uh increases in their salary and their income or something like that. And I think it's completely ridiculous. I mean, you can't, a resume writer can't do that. Yeah. I mean, they, they, I don't know why they put that stuff on their website because nobody will believe them. Right. And, and I certainly don't believe I can do that. I can't help somebody get a six figure increase on their, on their salary simply by writing a better resume. Right. Right. It's not that, but it is, the, the fact is the higher you go in your career, the fiercer the competition is, right? The number of people who compete with you is smaller, but the quality of the people who compete with you is greater than ever, right? The 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 chaff the chaff has been sort of sorted out by then, right? Now you're really competing against the wheat, right? And why would you give yourself such a weakness by having a shitty resume? Right. I just don't understand how people think that works. Right. That that you, you, you opening you you're giving yourself a, a vulnerability with that. Right. I'm not saying that a, a good resume is is make or break. Right. But it's just an, if it's a weak resume, it's a needless weakness. Right. And I help people iron out, remove that needless weakness. Right. And. A good resume is is a is a conversation starter, right? It's not a conversation ender, right? That's one of the big mistakes that um, a lot of people make. They think they have to pack every last little detail about their resume about their background into the resume. It becomes like four pages long. Nobody wants to read that, right? You're not supposed to preempt the interview with a resume. You're supposed to get it started. Yeah? You, you're supposed to create a basis for an interesting conversation. It's a hook for a conversation, right? And it doesn't take a genius to, to accomplish that, right? But apparently it often requires somebody who's done this for a living because right. a lot of resumes I see don't do that, right? So, so it's not so much that you create much of an edge or sort of that, uh, like a, a, what is it? Like a silver bullet or something like that. It's just more that think of the competition you have and and don't you know create this needless vulnerability for yourself and you know again on that topic um what what's your opinion or or kind of take on um when when people apply directly and a, a lot of companies now are using like ai to filter resumes um and what what's your kind of take on that and and what do you have a strategy for that if if people if companies are using a lot of ai to filter resumes so first of all, the good news is not that many companies do it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's talked about a lot, but um, the hiring managers, let's say, let me rephrase that. The, the HR hiring people that I've spoken to, unless they are in very big companies, don't rely on it very much. And the reason is that they know that AI is not mature enough you cannot rely on a machine to make deci uh, dis decisions of this level of importance. People are what drive every business, right? And quality in the people is everything. And HR know this and, they, and everybody in the company knows this, right? You do not delegate such an important decision to a machine that has not been tested, you know, 10 different ways and and uh, angles and and when you do put these machines to the test they don't perform that well right they are great i think for uh, uh let's say uh, removing the chaff yeah so if you if you get 10,000 resumes an ai can quickly remove i don't know 
right? And if you use it for that, and if you keep it pretty loose in your in your criteria that, that you submit to the AI, it's good, right? Because it's true. I mean, a lot of resumes that come into HR departments via job portals are completely useless. They're completely inappropriate for the positions that they apply to. And using an AI to filter that out, I think is good. But what is really a tragic mistake that is also being made by I say a small number of companies is to make it much tighter. Right? So to the extent that the HR person can basically yes. lean back and just, you know, uh, at the end of the day, they get five perfect resumes, right? I would not recommend that to any hiring manager or HR person. H AI is not at the point where you can rely on it to do that. Um, so, but, you know, the good news again is that doesn't happen very much. And so I'm not really so concerned with, AI and applicant tracking systems. And another reason for that is that typically senior executives that I deal with don't really face that anyway. They go either through executive recruiters or they go through um, they go through uh, their own network. Or if they apply via a job portal, of course they apply for senior roles, right? And at that level, um, the, the number of applicants that come in is much smaller than for mid-career or you know early career type of jobs where AI probably makes a lot more sense. So at the very senior levels, I don't think AI plays much of a role anyway. Right, which is a good thing. So, yeah. So yeah, what, what advice can you give to senior level executives that are looking for a career change or new opportunities? Okay, so I have... I have a number of, of points about that, but I'm going to limit myself to one. And this is addressed at the people who um, who are in a situation where they're no longer working. So 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 they're either coasting along in their in their current job and it's understood mutually between them and the company that they're basically preparing for a move out. Right. Or they've already moved out and they're on garden leave or um, or maybe they've been fired. I mean, it does happen. Right. Um, so I'm talking now purely to those people. I'm not talking to people who are still fully engaged in their jobs, right? This piece of advice may may apply to them or may not apply to them, but it certainly applies to people who are no longer really working hard, right? And my number one recommendation is start a side hustle. It has only upside and zero downside. Think about this. First of all, one problem that I think some executives go through when they're out uh, on the street uh, is that they get mental problem, mental health problems, right? They get a little anxious. They get a little depressed. It's, it's understandable, especially if that period keeps dragging on, right? Like some people, they think, okay, I'm out now, probably have a new job in, in a couple months. And then they don't, right? And then the months just you know, keep going on. The number of months just keeps keeps proliferating, right? And that can really take a toll on somebody's mental health, right? If they have a side hustle, if they have a business that they started, no matter how small it is, it keeps them engaged, right? It's mentally stimulating. Um, it's 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 interesting, right? You learn something, right? And you're doing something that's valuable, something of use, right? So the, just the mental health boost and keeping busy in itself is valuable, right? And then it looks better on your resume than saying I did nothing, right? I mean, it's, it's just a no-brainer to say I started a small business, see what, what what comes of it, right? Which is literally the truth of that's what you're doing, right? You're starting a new business, you're seeing where it goes, right? And that's how like almost all businesses get started, right? And if it doesn't work out, there's absolutely no harm in that, right? Like people understand, people, not every business idea ever works out, right? So, but the thing is, you've demonstrated now that you have an entrepreneurial instinct or, 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 or a, a, an interest, at least you're trying, right? Which is something that hiring managers will certainly appreciate. Yeah. And, and it's not just that you do that for the resume, but you're also doing it because it's true, right? By, by starting up a small business you are exposing yourself to the life of an entrepreneur. And that is something that is 
increasingly valued in corporate jobs, that perspective, right? A lot of white collar corporate warriors don't have that perspective, but that perspective is enormously valuable. The 360 degree of a business that you may not have if you're just focused on, you know, financial management or on marketing or on, uh, you know, whatever it may be, sales, right? Um, you don't get that 360 degree view, but you do get it as an entrepreneur, right? And then of course, finally, there is that possibility that it may work out and suddenly you're no longer looking for a job because you've got a business, right? And that business is growing rapidly. And then, you know, maybe in extreme cases, you get rich with it too, right? So there is no downside to starting a side hustle, only upside. And I don't understand why not far more people do this. So right. highly recommend it. Well, on that note, right? I mean, like, for example, how, how about people that maybe are in an industry where maybe they don't have the, the business idea to do that, right? I mean, looking at LinkedIn, is it possible to just kind of, they're, they're not attached to any company, um, you know, what would they put as their title? Should they leave their remaining company on there? Or should they say like freelance consultant in this industry or something like that and start using LinkedIn to, to post or what would be your yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I would go full all in. You know, I would make that a a a an item on my on my resume, and I would, you know, you, you don't necessarily have to have a company. Although, I mean, setting up a company in in many places in the Western world and in Japan is trivial. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't take a lot of time or money or effort. Right? It's very easy to do these days. Right? But uh, I mean, you don't necessarily have to even do that. You can just start as a sole proprietor. Um, uh, and, and, but you can give yourself a brand name, get your business, a brand name, and then just, uh, your title is founder, you know, mm. uh, and, uh, or whatever, you know, whatever sounds good to you. Right. And then, um, and then, yeah, I mean, if, if LinkedIn is the appropriate platform to advertise it, then do that. Right. I mean, it depends. Not every business is appropriately promoted on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a, is a, is a, uh, a professional platform. Um, if you're targeting, consumers were not, you know, at least not as potential customers are not white collar professionals, but are just, you know, general, just common people who might buy this gadget that you have or the service that you offer or the, this uh, content that you, that, that, that they can download from you, you know, then, you know, maybe LinkedIn is not the appropriate place. Maybe it's TikTok, you know, or mm. know, Facebook, you know, whatever, right? Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I would definitely, I would, I would, uh, make that very visible. It's a positive thing. It's a good thing. Yeah. Right. So Axel, thanks again for, for joining us and sharing your insights. Um, and yeah, for anyone out there that is, uh, interested in, uh, speaking with Axel or using his services, definitely reach out to him via uh, LinkedIn, uh, or email or on his career Zeus website directly. So Axel, thanks again. Thank you. It All was, right. It's fun. All right. So anyway, thanks for watching and uh, stay tuned for more great content from Coffee for Closers. Thanks again, Axel.